Thank you, Pastor Yanni. I must admit I'm in the over 45 category. <laughs> so I might need a fan <laughs> shortly. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to uh, the honor of sharing your pulpit. I don't take it lightly. Um, so, are you ready for Wednesday? It's Christmas, isn't it? So I want to ask you, what are the things you love about Christmas? Let's hear it. I knew somebody was going to say that first, the food, okay? Now that we got that behind us, what else do you love about Christmas? Family, holidays, what else? Oh, pre oh yes, of course. The gifts, how many of you like to do the shopping? I've been mall walking, so I got a little bit of a sore knee this morning. Okay, so there's so many little things that we love about Christmas. And uh, many of us also have a lot of traditions that we follow. Do you have such in your own homes, in your families? What are your traditions that you follow? Yes, anyone? Do you do carol singing? You do, you don't, you listen to the carols. So there's little things that we have as families that we follow. Uh, let me give you some examples. Um, for example, we allow our children to op open a gift the night before. The reason for that is because they're so excited by that time, they can't handle it anymore. So we just say, okay, yes, something for you the night before. And um, when we were growing up as little children, myself particularly, we had little traditions in our family that we used to follow. So we, uh, for example, we used to make, we didn't have much, but we used to, a week before Christmas, we would sit together as father, mother, and four children and make these Indian sweetmeats, which we made parcels of and gave to all our friends and our family. It was such a lovely time to be together. We would sit late into the night and make these lovely things. And if you know anything about Indian tradition, we don't make so much, we make so much, right? We cook a lot. So um, that's what we would do. So that was some of the traditions that we, we shared as a family. And um, the other thing that we, we, we loved to do was Christmas carols. So we would go to our, with our youth groups and later on with our home cells and just spread the joy of Christmas. The fact that we have a savior and we sing about his birth and share the joy with others. And it was also a very lovely tradition that, that we shared. So you'll find there's lots of traditions that we all have. There's lots of things that we do around Christmas time. Very often we say it's, the, it's that wonderful time of the year. Have you heard that little song? It's a wonderful time of the year. You know that one? Yes, it is a wonderful time of the year. And um, you know, I have a personal philosophy in life which I share very often. And that is uh, faith, family, and friends. So this morning I'm also going to share on that philosophy that I have. However, I'm just going to add, now, you know, since it's Christmas and all, I'm just going to give it a little bit of a twist. And you, you started it off this morning. So I'm going to say faith, family, and friends come together. So faith, family, and food. Yes. So, so um, you know, nowadays, me, uh, as I told you, growing up, what we used to do, but nowadays, I also have my own traditions in my home with my children and husband. Um, we, I mentioned one of them to you, what we do with the kids. Um, but I also have some secret recipes. Would you like to hear about them? Oh, there's interest, okay. There's nothing like giving me um, a yeah or a yes. So I'm gonna share a few recipes with you, right? So the first one, is let's start with the drinks firstly non-alcoholic okay so we're going to start with the punch right have you heard of the christmas punch it's a lovely drink mixed with a whole lot of things so here's the recipe if you're writing it down 
don't ask me after the service what I said. <laughs> okay, so what we do is we take canned peach, you know, peach slices or halves, and pineapples, canned pineapples, and we liquidize it. We add a grated apple to that, and some grandadella seeds or pips, and you can refrigerate that. And what we do with the liquid part of it is Sprite, two liters, and Grandadella Schweppes, two liters. Dump it all together, mix it up, and add ice. And there you have your Christmas punch, right? So that's what we love to drink on Christmas Day. That's my tradition. I'm sure you have your own, but I would love to share the recipes with you. Then the second one, which is also something that is a little bit of a family tradition started by my mother, and most of you have this one crumbed chicken right so we we it, it's a must whether they eat it or not it has to be on the table so what we do is we take chicken pieces we uh, season it with a whole lot of seasonings and steam it and thereafter we use an egg wash crumbs bread crumbs and we deep fry it chicken recipe done you will notice that I do things that are very easy to make, right? So that comes from, that's a working woman's guide to surviving Christmas. Okay, the third one is a very special one. My husband is vegetarian. So, you know, Christmas without a fruitcake is not Christmas. So, because fruitcake is so rich and you can eat so little, my sister-in-law has a vegetarian recipe for it's called eggless light fruit cake. Can be made very easily, and you can eat it as you eat a piece of sponge cake. That's how delicious it is. Very easy to make. So what do you need? You need cake mix. That's raisins, etc., mixed together. You need cake. I'm not giving you exact f uh, amounts, okay? So you need cake mix. You need some glazed cherries. And you also need um, self-raising flour with some bicarb thrown into it. What we do, and we add pecan nuts for that secret part of the recipe. So we mix all these ingredients and smash in the glazed cherries to give that lovely flavor. And then for your wet ingredients, we use margarine, condensed milk, and water, and we add a dash of almond essence and vanilla essence. Bring that to boil, dump it into the mixture, mix it, two cake pans at 180 degrees for 30 minutes. Recipe done. Can you see? Another easy one. And finally, I'm not going to share recipes the whole service, okay? So finally, trifle. Okay? Some of us only make trifle at Christmas time. So there's nothing better than a homemade trifle. Start with baking your own sponge cake, right? So what you do with it, you slice it up, you add it to a lovely decorative dish, and you soak it with cream soda. Another secret, right? So make sure you bake your own cake. Don't buy the Swiss roll from the shop. Right? Okay, so once you do that, all you have to do is add your custard, your jelly, your pecan nuts, and your uh, small pieces of canned peach or canned fruit, and cover that with fresh cream. Repeat that layer, and add flake crumbled on the top. So Christmas meal is now done and dusted. Those are my recipes that I wanted to share with you this morning. So we're done with the food, right? So can you tick food off for me, please? Right, food is ticked off. Okay, so let's move on. So now that we've taken care of the food, let's talk about the family. So there are two types of people out there that you find. The ones who are, we call them the Christmas lovers. They just love Christmas. The reason for the season is Christ's birth. He is with us. He died on the cross for our salvation. We know we are, have eternity that we're going to spend with Christ. These are the Christmas lovers. 
They would decorate their house, buy the gifts, do the shopping, be in church on time, go carol singing and the works, right? And for them, Christ, their Savior, was born. And everything is about the Christmas cheer. Okay, that's the one group. Then on the other side, you have the Christmas Scrooges. You heard of Mr. Scrooge? Yes. For them, what is all this fuss about? The house is getting too dirty. Who are all these unwanted family members? There's no snow in South Africa. Anyway, I'm all alone. I have no family. Just wait a minute. Do you have no family? Think about that carefully. You are here, you are sitting. This is your family. This is your big family that we have at Bachelor Home Church. You are part of a family. Remember that we have a heavenly father. So we all in a family relationship with each other. And that's very important for you to understand and know and accept and also make use of this family that you have. So in this church, for example, at Beth Shalom, we have also, you know, we are a big family. We can't, we can't talk to each other all the time because there's so many of us. But we have so many diverse kinds of family groups in this church. For example, you saw the band up here. They are a group. They are a family group. The sound team together with the band, they form a group. Now that we have other groups in the church. Um, we have, for example, we have the home cell groups. We call them different names from time to time. But we gather together. We are a group. We are a family. And we share so much together. Then you find in the church we've got a few ushering teams. They also they become family. They, they share together. They often socialize together. We've got children's church uh, 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 leaders and teachers. They also become a family together in the church, right? Then we also have um, the intercessory group, for example. I'm sure many of them will tell you that we are a family together as a group. So what is left for you is how do you, f how do you join this group? All you need is one friend in the church. So make that effort to actually speak to one person. Form one friend in the church. Thereafter, it takes care of itself. And, and you know, with, with, with family, you don't have to worry about food after that, right? Food takes care of itself. So it's important for us to... to ha you have your own family, you have your biological families. Some of us don't have that. We don't have the privilege of having all our families around us living in Polokwane. This is our family. So, you know, in, in speaking about family, we can't emphasize how much we take care of each other as family. Sometimes when you have bereavements, it's your church family that stands by you. So let's, let's look after this family and let's also make a concerted effort to join, to be part of the family. Don't be a silent member in this big family. Become part of the family. It's an action that you need to actually t to take to become a family member. Okay, now let's go to what I've actually prepared for you this morning and that is, that was my introduction by the way. I'm, I'm learning from Pastor Yanni. <laughs> Let's talk about our faith. And, you know, thinking about our faith, there's so much that we can, we can talk about when we talk about our faith. And um, I would like to urge you that nothing, nothing should interfere with your faith. Nothing should come between you and your faith. You know, we we, we we talking about Christmas and we're all in that kind of mode and in the season. But remember, that without Christ, there is no Christmas. Because to us, Christmas is Christ. The world tries to put an X, but we are adamant about that. Christmas is about Christ and nothing else. So let's remember that at this time of the year. And, you know, I feel what better way for us to learn about life, about everyday life, than for us to learn from Jesus Christ. And you know, very often you hear that people say Christ is the reason for the season. And that's so important. It becomes a cliche, a term we use. But really, the reason for the season that we are enjoying 
is because of Christ. Although it is Christmas, for, but for many of us, Christmas is just a day, okay? It's a reminder of um, the, the fact that Jesus was born, the fact that he died on the cross, and the fact that he lives in my heart today. Okay, that's very important. And they are, sometimes you'll hear things about the dates and so forth. Are you concerned about the dates? No. We should be concerned about the fact that we have a living Christ in us, all of us. That is very important. So let's come back to our daily lives and what does Christ mean to us in our daily lives. Remember that it doesn't mean that it's because of Christmas you're not going to face challenges. Some of you could be sick, some of you could be in a financial crisis, some of you could be having problems with your children, uh, some of you could be going through a divorce, some of you may not have jobs, some of you may be in an abusive relationship, some of you, your marriage is on the rocks, some of you, you are just lonely, there could be people going through dep depression, some people can't have children, others have lost a loved one, some of you have no food, you don't have your own home, you don't know where you're going to sleep, many of you could be in debt, some of you could be having problems at work, I mean, I'm, I'm listing the things that we face daily. How many of you have challenges daily? Let's see your hands. Right, we do have challenges and we, uh, we, we need to know how do we face these challenges? What do we do? Uh, so, uh, now I'm going to take you to the manual for life. You know what's the manual for life? We all have many copies of the manual. Let's use it this morning, okay? So let's open to the Bible. This is what one of the writers, we in Matthew 5. This is one of uh, 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 the writers, the manual writers, that's Matthew. He gives us a, an account of Jesus' life. And he starts first with the genealogy, that is where Jesus came from, the line from which he came. And then he, uh, he, he uh, moves on to Jesus' birth. And then he moves on to, he speaks about the uh, teachings of Jesus. And then he also speaks of the miracles that Jesus performed. So for this morning, I'm just going to focus on the teachings of Jesus. And I'm, I've just selected a few of the teachings that I'd like to look at. So we're going to look at, firstly, at Matthew 5, verses 2 to 11. Matthew 5, verses 2 to 11. This part of the scripture is often called the Beatitudes, right? Uh, and it serves as an encouragement to us. It serves as a motivation to us. There are a lot of us, you know, when we want motivation, we call a motivational speaker to the church, etc., or to our workplaces. But today I'm going to show you that our motivation is here in the Bible. Our motivational speaker is Jesus and his exact words. So this is what he says. He says in, in uh, Matthew 5 verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are, will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in, he in heaven. So these are what we call the Beatitudes. And can you see that the situations that you face, because of your belief in Jesus Christ, what is he telling us there? You're called blessed because you're enduring that. And very often, most of the scriptures say that your reward is in heaven. So be encouraged by this. You know, a, a friend of mine lost her brother during the course of this week. And um, she has a big family, 
And she, this is what she told me. She said, you know what, I had to be the peacemaker in my family this week. And uh, sometimes peacemaking can be very stressful on you because you're trying to you know, bring everyone together. You're trying to, uh, um, to keep the peace in your family, in your home, in your, in your relationship, in your, at your workplace. But what is Jesus saying? Blessed are the peacemakers. Doesn't that encourage you? Those of you who bring peace, sometimes you feel, why am I doing this? There's nothing in it for me. Uh, people don't care. I'm the one who's trying to bring everybody together. Be encouraged, be reassured. You are called blessed. Now, if you look at Matthew uh, 5, verses 13 and 14, this is probably the most preached scriptures in the Bible. And what is Jesus teaching us here? He's telling us that we are the salt of the world. He's telling us we are the light of the world. So those of you who are sitting here and you are feeling small, you're feeling alone, you know, it's Christmas time, you're alone. Some of you may be feeling insignificant. Oh, it's just me, I'm nobody. Sometimes you're feeling insecure. But what I want to tell you is that read the scripture and arise. You have some salting to do. You have some lighting to do. So turn to your neighbor, just in case they're falling asleep, and say, hey, arise, you got some salting to do, you got some lighting to do. Okay, so, so this is also an encouragement to all of us. We have been called a light, a light is shining in darkness, bringing hope, bringing uh, bringing peace in situations. So we've been, called, we've been called the salt of the earth, the salt of the world. It, you know, we're adding flavor, that's who we are. So leave all those negative thoughts. That is for, uh, for people who don't believe. We are believers. And we believe that we are the salt, we are the light. So we need to stand up and take our position as the salt and the light. Now I'm going to go through a few of, of the teachings that are mentioned here. And uh, in Matthew 5, uh, 6 and 7. So this is what Jesus was teaching us. And, and it's very important for us to understand and gain some nuggets of wisdom from his teachings. The first one is, what does D Jesus teach us about murder? So am I speaking to the right group of people? You'll say, but I'm not a murderer. Okay, I found this very fascinating and thought-provoking when I actually looked at the scripture. Because what Jesus says is that in Matthew 5.21, he says, long ago people said, don't mur murder. But what is he telling us? He's telling us that, you, that if you are angry with your brother, you will be judged. Now, I, I just thought to myself, what's that got to do with murder? You know, angry with your brother. What's that got to do with murder? Do you know murders, murder, the thoughts of murder come into your mind from a position of being angry? And many of us, we do get angry. So some people take that further, you know, into murder. So what, we are, what is he saying is that uh, we, we should actually, uh, you know, before we get to the point of murder, Jesus brings in reconciliation. Reconciliation is to get together, where you set, settle matters amicably, amicably. And he speaks about also going to court. Some, some, do you know some family members take each other to court for somebody else to reconcile them? And we as believers, we should actually practice what Jesus is talking about. We should reconcile with each other because that was what Jesus' love is all about. Let's look at the next one. What does Jesus teach us about adultery? Matthew 5 verse 27. Again, he tells us the same thing, that people say do not commit adultery. But what is he saying? That if you look at another woman or man with lustful thoughts, you have already committed adultery. Then he talks about, uh, you know, if your eye, the lust you're seeing with your eye, you must gorge it out. If your hand does something, you should cut it off. Now, please don't take this literally, okay? Do you, I'll give you an example of somebody I know. Uh, well, he's late now. But what he did was that he was abusive towards his wife. He used to hit her. 
And he, he well, this is a bit gory, right? He took his hand and put it into a machine and he cut off, he cut off his wrist, that part of it. And he refused to have it sewn back because he said that his hand committed the, the act of, you know, a, abusing his wife. But, um, w but what are we learning here? The principle is that, what he is saying is that we must be pure with our whole body. Right? We must be pure with the whole body, all parts of it. So sometimes we actually need it to read into the word in greater, with greater revelation into actually what the word is saying. What does Jesus say about divorce? Don't get divorced, Matthew 5, 31, except for marital unfaithfulness. You know, I've always wondered why this one exception? And then, after talking to a few people, you know, family, friends, over a number of years and their experiences, I, I realized that people often say that all the signs were there, the signs were there even before they got married, but yet they did get married anyway. And some of them say that if I did it again, I would have reacted differently to certain things that happened to in, in my marriage. Now, what am I saying? In, in other words, the people and the situations can be fixed in various ways. Whatever you're going through in that marriage can be fixed in various ways. However, when you break the marriage bond through unfaithfulness, you're actually breaking a very sacred bond and that allows you to be released from the marriage. There's a lot for us to think about here. Uh, then what does Jesus say about oaths? Right? Now, oaths is not necessarily swearing, you know, some of us have the tendency to do that. It's not referring to that. It's, it's actually referring to when we use the name of the Lord. You know, some of us say, I swear on the Bible that I did not do this or did not say that. I swear on Jesus. You know, they think that they're using these things uh, like Jesus and the Bible to convince others. But you don't have to do that. If what the scripture is trying to teach you is integrity. Integrity means if I, your yes must be your yes, your no must be your no. If you promise something to somebody, keep to your promise. If you say no, be firm with, with saying no. Right? Then, what does Jesus say about an eye for an eye? I like this one. Matthew 5 verse 38. You know what we say? You punch me, I'll punch you. And I heard my, my neighbor often uses this term, I'll blixom you, right? And we say, okay, I'll teach you a lesson. Some of us say you messed with the wrong person. You know, because it's about you now, right? But what is Jesus saying? Now this is fascinating. So he says if somebody hits you on the right cheek, on the left cheek, you must turn the other cheek. In other words, hit me again, right? Isn't that a bit strange? What is he saying? You must go an extra mile. If somebody tells you go one mile, you'll say, no, I'll come with you for two. It's, it's, it's you know, strange philosophy, but why are we saying that? And he's saying don't turn people away when they ask you for something or they want to borrow something from you. You know me, I'm very particular about borrowing, okay? Especially borrowing a car. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe in that. And uh, to prove me true, uh, Suresh once borrowed somebody's uh, family's bucky and, and, and he smashed, smashed it. So, um, you know, we have this thinking in our head that we shouldn't borrow. But when somebody is in need and needs to borrow something, what is Jesus telling us? Don't turn them away. We have our own philosophies about this. No, last time you came here, you're asking me again, and what, what, what. But let's look at what the word is saying. And I want to tell you what the principle of what Jesus is teaching here. He's trying to tell you, be kind, be gentle, be a kind-hearted person in your actions, even to evil people. Be kind to them. Now, it's a good philosophy for us to learn. We want to be like Jesus. So it's something, you know, for us to really think about. What does Jesus teach us about our enemies? It's very simple. All of you know it. What does Jesus say about your enemies? Yes. Jesus says, love your enemies. And that is one of, one of the very difficult things to do. 
And the reason why we follow it, because we say that Jesus is love and perfection and we want to be like him. So if he says love our enemies, there's a reason why he wants us to love our enemies. So that we can be made perfect in Jesus. So what does he say about giving to the needy? Now you'll see on your Facebook account and Instagram, etc. People are flashing all the photos of all the giving they did, the feeding schemes, the orphanages they visited. What is he saying about how we should take care of the needy? Matthew 6, verse one to four, verses 1 to 4 says, Don't announce when you give to the needy. Actually, it goes on further, you know, to say that... Um, maybe I should say this. There's nothing wrong with giving to the needy. We should be doing it. But what we should not be doing is making a big hoo-ha out of that. Because the scripture goes on further to say is that your right hand should not know what your left hand is doing. They're both in the same body. So if the one ministry goes out and does something, the other ministry doesn't have to know about it in the church. Unless, of course, you, you know, we're working together on a project. But the, the, the principle that is being taught here is that we should give we, the needy because it's out of our heart that we're giving them. It's just the pureness of our heart, but not with intentions of getting other people to know what we are doing. Right? So uh, that, that's something very nice for us to learn because very often we, we say, I gave this and I did that. It becomes about you. Be but what actually giving to the needy means, Jesus is just using you, is using you and your ability to give to meet the needs of somebody else. Right? So we're just being an instrument in God's hands when we are giving to the needy. What does Jesus teach us about prayer? And this is a very important part of, the, of, this, uh, of his teachings. In Matthew 6, verses 5 to 15, Jesus teaches us two important things here. Firstly, he says that our prayer must be heartfelt. And actually, he tells us specifically, pray privately. Go into your closet where it's between you and God. Close the door. Now, why is he saying that? Because what people normally do is that they want to come into the church and pray loudly or... It's, it's basically, it's not about you. It's about you and your relationship with God. Because some, some people want to pray so that others can see, right? Because in the day, people used to pray out like that, loud, and just so that the others can hear what they are praying. It's not about that. Praying is about your relationship with God. So that's the first point that he teaches us here. Uh, and please don't confuse this with corporate prayer. Your personal prayer should be done in your personal time. Corporate prayer is what we do in church. So let's not just say, I'm going to stay quiet in church and not pray because Jesus said you must play in your closet, okay? So, um, and then the second thing is that... Um, he, he mentions those eloquent, long prayers that you think God needs to hear. And he, what he's saying is that God knows what you need, want, and what to say before you even pray it, right? So don't pray those long and re repeating prayers. God already knows. Don't, don't make it complicated. It's just simple. Prayer is simple. It's just you talking to God and sharing your heart, your thoughts, what you want to do, and you know, direction from God. Uh, there's another one of, of the teachings of Jesus that talks about storing treasures on earth. Now, during this past week, how many of you have a lot of treasures stored? Okay, you, you're very silent on me now. So go and open those cupboards and you'll find all your lovely treasures. And uh, you know, sometimes you don't want to give them away because they prized possessions. And uh, I've been, we've been spring cleaning this week. Eesh, we found lots of treasures there. But we had to get rid of them. Um, because, you know, we treasures, literally in my house, the treasures had mothballs on them, right? Of what use is that? Because what the word Jesus is teaching us here is that these treasures on earth, you're going to leave them here, they're going to gather dust, but what should we, what is he teaching us here? Is that we should be 
storing treasures in heaven. What are, how do you store treasures in heaven? You know, things like salvation, right? Uh, sharing the gospel with others. So these are the things that we do in order to, 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 to store treasure in heaven. Now he also speaks about, if you look at Matthew 6, 21, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we must use our earthly treasures that we have to advance the kingdom of God. Let's say, for example, you have a whole lot of blankets and it's winter and the people who need the blankets and you're not using them. You need to give it away, okay? You're storing up the treasure when somebody actually needs it. So your heart should be there. For example, you know, this is very true of people. When you store things, you're worried about those things. If you, for example, um, you, you have many houses, you are concerned, you have to do this, you have to do that. Can you see where your heart goes and where your heart should be? So that's a very important lesson for us to, to take from what Jesus is teaching here. And we must be very careful, he says in the word, of how we use our money. Because we can't serve two masters. You either serve man or you serve money. And we are here, sorry, you serve God or you serve money. And we know we want to serve God. So money, sh money is good for us, but don't let it become a God in your life. That's very important. So... I have a few more. What does Jesus say about worrying? Okay, how many of you seated here have never worried? Let me see your hands. I really need to meet you. Yes. So we, we, we do from time to time, we worry about things. But here is our, our Savior telling us about, about worrying because he knows our heart. He knows what we worry about. And, you know, it's, this is about faith. This scripture is about faith. Because in Matthew 6, 25, he says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. And you and I know that this is not an easy thing to do, not to worry. Especially when you know that's the last of my can of tin beans that I have. Right? Um, and then, maybe I should also ask you this. If you worry, will you live longer? No. He says you won't add another day to your life if you worry. So why are you worrying? But, so you may ask yourself, you know what, but I need, you know, like we always say but, 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 right? But what is he teaching us here? He's telling you to have faith in our great God. What, what must we have faith for? That he will supply our needs. He will supply our desires. He will give us food. He will clothe us. He uses lovely examples in the scripture. In, um, he talks about the lilies of the field, how he clothes them. He talks about the sparrows, how he, uh, he feeds them. So what we need to understand is that God is telling us, have faith in me, I will take care of your needs. Right? Uh, and then what follows... This part is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, and that's Matthew 6, 33. But in order to do that, what does he tell us? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things that we're worrying about will follow. Right? So you will get the things that you're worrying about. You need to concentrate on seeking the face of God. And that's very important for us. And uh, I believe that, you know, putting God first is crucial in our lives. And I, I have many lessons of having done that and having reaped the benefits of it. So I can tell you that it works and it doesn't help you to worry. What does Jesus say about judging others? Matthew 7 verse 1. What does it say? You, you can tell me. What does Jesus say about judging others? Don't judge others, right? Now that is a very difficult thing to do, believe me. Somebody's dress is too short, somebody's arms are not covered, um, somebody ran a red robot. I mean, it's, we do it every day in so many different ways. We judge things, we judge people, how they look, how they talk, how they eat, how they whatever, right? We, are, we, 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 we do this very often, but what is the the word saying to us, 
we should not judge others. Because why? Because we ourselves have the fault. Look here, you, you, you're pointing fingers and you're judging people. What's happening here? The three fingers are pointing at you. He also uses the example in the word about the, the, the speck of dust. That small one finger in your brother's eye, you want to go and pull it out and you concerned about it, yet you have a big plank in your own eye. Can you see what I mean? So we all have our faults. Let's not pick out the faults in other people. Let's try to deal with ourselves, right? Let's fix ourselves. Okay, and then finally, just looking at my time, I'm almost there. What does Jesus say about us approaching him in Matthew 7 verse 7? This was my late dad's favorite scripture. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. This is like a hakuna matata moment. What a lovely philosophy, right? If you want something, ask. How will I know that you need something if you don't ask me? Right? If a door is closed to you, it will remain closed until you knock and somebody says, come in. Right? If you want something, go look for it. It's not going to come to you. Go and look for it. Seek and you will find. Now this applies to spiritual things. It also applies to physical things in our life. Right? So in everything that you do, uh, verse 12 of Matthew 7, it says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them to do to you. Isn't that lovely? You want to do things, for example, you want to feel loved. You, if you want to feel love, love others, right? If you, if you, if for example, if you, if you are needy, out of your own need, bless others. And that's when you open up the door for your, for your blessings to flow. And then finally, in conclusion, so like the pastor, I have first conclusion, second conclusion, third conclusion. <laughs> so Renee, for this morning, since it's Christmas, I would like to say to you all that as you enjoy your food and your family over Christmas, you must allow the Lord Jesus to reinforce your faith in him and in the word of God your faith in the word of God. So my second conclusion, Renee, would be my parting words that if you need any answer in your life's journey, anything, anything that you need, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And can you see how fast my conclusions come, un unlike the pastor? And my final conclusion is that um, okay, before I get to the final conclusion. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I've mentioned quite a number of Jesus' teachings of what he taught us. But you realize that we, we fail and we falter in many of these things. So I, I hope you haven't been nudging your, your children or husband and wife and said, see, I shouldn't have married you or whatever, you know, the case is. Remember that Jesus taught us these things and we, we sin, we come f short of the glory of God, right? We sin. There are many of the teachings that many of us say, oh, I'm having a problem with that. But also remember what Jesus says, there is no condemnation to those who believe. If you believe in Jesus, there is no condemnation. Remember he says, 70 times 7 in a day, you ask for forgiveness, he will forgive you. We, we, we serve a loving God, a forgiving God. So don't feel condemned. Nobody is judging each other. We all fail. So let us use what Jesus' teachings to help us so that we become perfect like him. And now, finally. So from us, from us as a family and to you and to all your loved ones and your families, we want to wish you a very Christ-filled Christmas. Remember, what's the reason for the season? And we would love to see you all here on Wednesday morning at 8.30. Thank you, Pastor. Over to you. Thank you. Did you get that word this morning? Amen. She was picking on me a bit, I think.
Uh, Jessica, thank you so much. It was such a mouthful. Can I just quickly shout out for me? We, we, the, the, you know when there's so many parts being mentioned like this, there's some of them that will speak to you and others to you and others to you and others to you. Um, just by, uh, by shouting out to me quickly, w w what part spoke to you? Food. <laughs> okay, apart from the food. Love. We need to love one another. Don't judge one another. What else? Quickly. Shout it out. Don't worry. Be happy. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't be concerned about so many things, about what we will wear. Uh, what else? Quickly. Turn, ooh, turn the other cheek. When somebody hits you, turn the other cheek. What else? Quickly. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Family is important. Amen. We had kind of a, a fruit salad here today. We, we've learned so many things. Trifle. <laughs> we have trifle here. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for sharing with us. And you know the thing is this, when we hear the word, let's go and apply the word. I'm so glad she ended off by saying we are still all on a journey. None of us have arrived. Um, and some things you, some people will not battle with, other things uh, some people will battle with. And certain things that I don't have problems with, you might have challenges with. Some of the things that you have overcome long ago, I might still be challenging, find challenging in my life. We are all on a journey, so let us journey together. Let us encourage one another to say, you know what, I've heard some of these things this morning, but I want to encourage you to say, keep strong, keep on going forward, don't give up, don't uh, fall by the wayside, because uh, we, uh, we are just about to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And please join us on... On Wednesday morning, we, I believe we can have a great time together. Amen. Stand with me. Let us close in prayer. And then as you leave this morning, uh, greet, greet a few people around you after I have prayed. And then, uh, then, we will be, then we will be leaving. Let us pray together. Father God, this morning we are so blessed to have a family like this. We are so blessed to love one another. We are so blessed that we can have patience with one another. Thank you that you are here to uplift and to encourage one another. And the more we see the world falling apart around us, the more that we, think we see wrong things around us, the more we want to move closer to you. And therefore, we want, to, we want to say, yes, Lord, here we are. Again, we want to commit our lives to you. We want to commit in growing in your grace, Father. We want to commit in loving one another, in caring for one another. And therefore we pray as we leave this building this morning that we will truly be the salt of the earth. We will be the light of the world to go and light in a dark world out there. Be glorified and be exalted in and through us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. There we go. God bless you. Have an absolutely wonderful week and see you on Wednesday morning. God bless. See you.